All right, well, first off, thank you to our community partners for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about us, military medicine. Um, so some of the things we're gonna to touch on today. Uh, well, first of all, our panel, as they mentioned, is Colonel Tracy Swingle. She's the 75th Med Group Commander. As you can kind of see up there, has been in the military a little longer than I have. Um, has been all around the world with assignments and on multiple deployments. And I myself am at about the 19 year mark and similar. I've been all around the world with assignments and on multiple deployments as well. So we're your two panel members for today. Uh, as far as disclosures, we have nothing financial to disclose at this time. And our objectives are gonna be, uh, I'm just gonna up a little bit so I can see a little better. Um, we're gonna try to provide an overview of military health system. It is going through a lot of transition at this time and Colonel Swing will definitely kind of walk you through that. In addition to that, we're gonna kind of discuss Hill Air Force Base's mission. I know you tend to hear the loud jets, but there's a lot more going on on that base than just those planes that are flying around. And then I'll kind of take you through operational medicine, more of a historical approach to it and kind of where we're headed in the future. And then we'll wrap it up with sort of our medical standards and reliability programs um, and why it's important for us to kind of reach out to you to be able to do some of those things. Um, so we'll get there. And with that, I will hand off to Colonel Swingle, and she can talk to you about our transition that we're working through. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, so um, I'm your opening act. Uh, I'm going to give you the administrative discussion about the transformation of military medicine um, as an enterprise. Um, I am a hospital administrator by trade, uh, so the main act is your doctor that's sitting right next to me, who is, who is my deputy commander. So I just so want to talk to you a little bit so about the military health system and where right we now. have nope. where we came nope. from and where and we're going. Exactly. So yes, as we all know okay. that we have know three branches great. of military okay. medicine, the Army, the right Navy, now. and the Air Force. Uh, the Navy supports the Marine Corps. Um, and that's how we've been segregated for since the conception of all of the services. Now, under the NDAA, Congress has said you, military health system, will join forces and create a joint environment. Um, one, to save taxpayers money, to standardize the way that we deliver health care in garrison and downrange, and to standardize our medical equipment, our training, and you know, ultimately be able to have a standard joint force that can deploy anywhere in the world and have the same stuff at their hands with the same training, with the same um, defibrillator so in the same on? OR setting. Um, and we haven't done that in the past. It's the biggest merger in DOD um, that, has e that DOD's ever seen. So it, it's a huge undertaking. We are in about year three of it. Uh, there are some areas that have been transferring for the last several years. IT was one of them. That sounds right um, to me. So it's going to be a huge overhaul for the military health system. And I think that's important for you so to understand because a lot of you touch our airmen. Uh, we, we do a lot of military medicine outside of the gate uh, because we don't have the resources. And we need this community partnership. Uh, whether you're here or at a different state that services one of our bases and our airmen. Um, airmen is a big airman. It's our active duty. Um, it's our active duty. It's our dependents. It's our contractors and it's our DOD employees. And, and you help us take care of all of them. So thank you for that. Uh, the military health system, just to, to give you an overview, and I'm going to show you a quick video. Um, it's not just a health care delivery system. We have our own medical education, which I'm sure you've heard of, where we train and develop our own physicians, our own dentists. Um, we have our own public health in the military health system, so epidemiology and the prevention of disease uh, is big in our public health division. We also, uh, of course, have a private sector community partnership that is key to, and essential to the military health system being successful. And then we are on the cutting edge of research also. So it's not just about delivering the health care benefit to the airman that wears this uniform. Uh, there's many areas that fall under the military health system. Right now we have one, almost 1 1.5 million on active duty across the enterprise that we service. We have about 350,000 reserve components that we take care of. And we have almost 10 million in beneficiaries and under the dependents and our <coughs> retirees that we provide health care for the rest of their life. Um, and then just one more thing. Um, when we talk about the NDA and the transformation, 
um, our new DHA. So you're going to hear military health system, and then you're going to hear the defense, defense health agency. That is my new boss. So I work for the wing and support the wing commander, but I also work for General Place, who is the de defense health agency. And he's our overarching boss. And he says, this transformation is all about the patient. It's about harvesting decades of best practices from across the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, along with what we can learn from our civilian community to build a global standard with one focus, make our system better to improve health outcomes that matter to our patients. So that is the goal um, that we are doing as we do this transition under uh, the Defense Health Agency. So I'm going to show you a quick video. On the battlefield, every second counts. Need more people for litter bearers! Here is where the military health system comes together to make the difference between life and death. This is where military medicine begins. In a single decade from some of the most austere places on Earth, we have built a lifeline that stretches thousands of miles. A lifeline that moves ill and injured service members from the point of injury to combat hospitals en route back home to the United States. Blood pressure is 91 over 55. Every step of the way, we deliver critical care. This remarkable health system of Army, Navy, and Air Force medical personnel cares for soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and all who come in harm's way. What we're doing today is digital subtraction and geography to evaluate the blood supply. It's joint, it's integrated, it's impressive, and produce the highest survival rates in the history of warfare. But this is just one part of the military health system. The military health system is also a health delivery system. 57 hospitals, over 400 clinics around the globe. More than 9 million Americans who are military members, their families and retirees count on us and we deliver. Each year, over 50,000 babies, over 50 million prescriptions filled, rehabilitation, recovery. The military health system is also a medical education system. Each year, the Uniformed Services University produces over 300 military physicians and specialized medical leaders. And our medical education and training campus turns out over 26,000 medical enlisted personnel from every branch of service. We're also an integrated healthcare plan with a global network of care. We partner with civilian doctors and hospitals to deliver the promise we make to those who serve and their families. The military health system is also a public health system. Our military medical labs around the world conduct surveillance to detect and stop the spread of disease and to ensure the safety of the environment. The military health system is a national leader in medical research, collaborating with science and academia, bringing life-saving products to the battlefield and to every American. Eyes blink, pupils dilate. Simulated patients, life-saving blood clotting products, mind-controlled prosthetics, new vaccines, laboratory-grown skin, arm transplants. It's like I, I went back four years and uh, I'm, I'm me again. Our research improves health, speeds recovery, transforms the practice of medicine. The massive earthquake and tsunami that rocked Japan. And we are a global force for good, responding to disasters and humanitarian crises whenever we are called, and building capabilities in our partner nations, floating hospitals, medical supplies, transport. It's joint. It's integrated. It's impressive. We're like no other health system in the world, and we're increasing our engagement with federal health partners, including the Department of Veterans Affairs, bringing Army, Navy, and Air Force medical capabilities together. This remarkable system exists for a primary mission, to ensure every service member, whether active or reserve, is ready. Medicine, a system focused on health more than health care. A medical force ready to respond, ready to repair both the visible and the invisible wounds of war. A unifying mission, personal courage, and selfless sacrifice. Integrated care, world-class results. It's joint, it's integrated, it's impressive. 
We even make house calls anywhere, anytime, like no one else. This is the Military Health System. Okay, so I, ho I hope that gives you a, a kind of an idea of, of all the things that we do um, in the military uh, to support our warfighter. This, uh, I'm going to show you one more video because it, it tells the story very well. And this is about Hill Air Force Base. Uh, you know, I, usually when I walk in, I have a uniform on. The first thing that people ask me uh, in the civilian community is, do you fly planes? Well, no, don't do that. Then they find out I'm in healthcare, and the first thing they say is, are you a doctor? No, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> then it's usually a nurse. So what I wanted to share with you today was what Hill Air Force Base is because a lot of you probably live here. I know some of you have traveled here, but the dynamics on Hill is so much broader than what you see when you drive by the gate on 15. Um, there are over 50 mission partners on this base, and what comes out of Hill Air Force Base is so important to the Air Force and to other branches of the ser service. You will hear on the, on the video, we are the main landing gear facility in the DOD at Hill Air Force Base, the landing gear on the planes. We overhaul the planes here. We have a huge mission partner with Northam Grumman. Um, and so I wanted to share with you what, what actually happens at Hill Air Force Base. And this really good captain does a really good job of that. So we're going to play this. And after that, um, Colonel Nussbaum, he'll, we'll turn it over to him. Um, so I'll stop here. But I just wanted to say first, thank you on behalf of Hill Air Force Base and Colonel Carroll. Uh, the wing commander, she, um, she, she loves the community partnerships that we have. Um, I have to brief her all the time as if my airmen are getting taken care of out in the community. And I tell, them, tell her every time, hands down, this is the far the best community health care that I've seen um, in a small place that delivers the great care that you deliver in 32 years that I've been in. We don't see our, um, our retirees on, in my clinic anymore because you have their back and you're taking such good care of them. So before I turn it over to him, I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of Hill Air Force Base and the medical group. And now you know who I am, so if, if any of you guys want to partner or come on base or see what we do, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and we'll make those connections happen. Bordered by the colorful Wasatch Mountains to the east and the Great Salt Lake to the west, Northern Utah's Hill Air Force Base is home for missions for the United States Air Force, the Department of Defense, and other national organizations. Groundbreaking for construction of Hill Air Force Base occurred in 1940. The base's history reflects the heritage of the United States Air Force and in particular, Air Force Materiel Command. Spanning nearly 7,000 acres, the base is surrounded by the supportive communities of Layton, Clearfield, Sunset, Roy, Riverdale, Ogden, and South Weaver. Employing more than 24,000 military, civilian, and contract personnel, Hill Air Force Base, which is part of the Air Force Sustainment Center, is the second largest base in the Air Force by population and geographic size. The 75th Air Base Wing is the base host unit, managing 1 million acres and more than 1,700 facilities, valued at more than $4 billion. The wing delivers exceptional support to all of its mission partners through its civil engineering group, mission support group, medical group, communications and informations directorate, and several wing staff agencies, chapel, finance, legal, public affairs, and other operations support functions. Additionally, the 75th is the Air Force's single provider of the standard air munitions packages, or STAMP, to support wartime taskings across the globe. Nearly half of the base's real estate is dedicated to the safe storage, depot level maintenance, and rapid processing of lethal munitions, ensuring warfighters have the combat power to fight and win our nation's wars. The wing also operates one of the top attractions in Northern Utah, the Hill Aerospace Museum. The 75th is responsible for providing support to the Ogden Air Logistics Complex, 388th and 419th Fighter Wings, Air Force Life Cycle Management Center, Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center, ICBM Directorate, and more than 50 other mission partners. 
All of these partners, each playing a critical role in our nation's defense, are collectively known as Team Hill. The largest organization on Hill Air Force Base is the Ogden Air Logistics Complex, employing nearly 9,000 military, civilian, and contract personnel. The complex is responsible for providing logistics and maintenance support for the nation's premier fighters, including the F-35 Lightning II, F-22 Raptor, F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the A-10 Thunderbolt II. In addition, it maintains the C-130 Hercules, the T-38 Talon, and 27 other actively flying and proven weapon systems. The ALC is one of the leading Department of Defense providers of software, hydraulics, secondary power systems, composites, and ICBM rocket motors. The complex is also the Air Force's landing gear center for industrial and technical expertise. The Ogden Air Logistics Complex operates the Department of Defense's Aircraft Regeneration, Storage, and Preservation Facility at davis mothan Air Force Base in Arizona, and additional maintenance operations in Japan, Colorado, Nebraska, Texas, Florida, California, Wyoming, North Dakota, and Montana. Two of the most visible units at Hill Air Force Base are the Active Duty 388th and Reserve 419th Fighter Wings. Together, they fly and maintain the Air Force's first combat-coded F-35A Lightning II fighter aircraft. The 388th Fighter Wing is an Air Combat Command unit made up of 1,800 active duty and civil service professionals who deliver game-changing combat capability, standing ready to deploy worldwide at any time. Active duty pilots, maintainers, and support personnel work side by side in a total force partnership with the 419 Fighter Wing, a reserve unit of 1,200 personnel. The 419th is the only Air Force Reserve Wing in Utah and is made up of three groups and 10 squadrons. In addition to providing F 35 combat capability, the wing has a full spectrum mission support role. The 388th Fighter Wing operates the Utah Test and Training Range, a 1 million acre land space in Utah's West Desert. The UTER provides training capabilities for our combat air forces and test and evaluation of new and existing Department of Defense weapons and is used by militaries worldwide. The Air Force Life Cycle Management Center is responsible for total life cycle management of Air Force and coalition partner weapon systems and subsystems. At Hill Air Force Base, more than 2,700 military, civilian, and contract employees provide complete management for the host of programs and associated services. The LCMC portfolio includes cradle-to-grave management of air-delivered weapons, early warning radar systems, and mature and proven aircraft systems. The Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Systems Directorate, which reports to the Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center at Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico, is responsible for the acquisition and modernization required to sustain the Minuteman III ICBM force, as well as the nation's newest ICBM, the Ground-Based Strategic Deterrent System, an $86 billion total system replacement for the Minuteman III. The Directorate is responsible for a $22 billion portfolio supporting the acquisition, systems engineering, depot repair, and modernization required to sustain our nation's silo-based ICBM fleet. The Directorate delivers safe, secure, responsive, and on-time, on-target nuclear deterrent force to the warfighter as the nation's nucleus for the ICBM development, acquisition, and sustainment. In order to accommodate Team Hill's many current and emerging missions, it's become necessary to find unique and cost-effective ways of modernizing the base's infrastructure. In response to demands on the base's resources and infrastructure, Hill Air Force Base partnered with private developers to create a mixed-use commercial development on nearly 550 acres on the installation's west side, adjacent to Interstate 15. As the largest enhanced use lease project in the Department of Defense, Falcon Hill National Aerospace Research Park provides new office and research space for roughly 6,000 Hill Air Force Base personnel and contractors, as well as retail establishments, restaurants, and other commercial development. Team Hill has built a proud heritage and enjoys tremendous support from the local community. This outpouring of support for our airmen and civilians who serve is a visible reminder of the community's patriotism and enduring commitment to our nation's military. They are vital to Hill Air Force Base's continued mission success. Team Hill is committed to our nation's security by sustaining America's warfighters, protecting air power, and deploying airmen to engage in war. 
deterring aggression and maintaining peace around the world, we will meet any challenge, overcome any obstacle, and defeat any enemy. This is Team Hill. All right, so as you can see, that's a very uh, dynamic and mixed mission there at Hill Air Force Base. It's not just the planes flying around. There's a lot of activity going on there all day long. So, and on the weekends and 24 hour seven shifts, so it's just, it's a busy, busy base. Uh, one of the busiest ones I've ever been to. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna transition us into operational medicine. Um, and more gonna kind of take you on a journey of operational medicine. So kind of a historical approach and how operational medicine was early on and where we are today with that and then kind of talk a little bit about our medical standards and stuff that we deal with in the Air Force. So moving on, first one I want to introduce you to is uh, Baron uh, Dominique Jean Leray. So this was a French individual who was part of the Napoleonic uh, era. With, he was the chief surgeon of the French Army at the time. And he really made some big moves towards helping establish operational medicine. And as you can see up there, I'm sure all of you can relate to this idea that you kind of have to commit yourself wholly to medicine. Uh, whether you're on call on the weekends or you've been called in, in the world of military medicine, when we're deployed, we work seven days a week. We're there all the time. We really don't get a day off, and so we have to commit ourselves to that event. And then he kind of epitomized this as we get through and learn a lot more about him. So he had a 20-year period. He did 25 campaigns, 60 battles, and over 400 engagements. He did this basically with a pistol and a saber on his side. When I was in Afghanistan, I only had a pistol, so he was one up on me. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, he really was involved in the front lines and uh, just embodied um, sanitation, epidemiology, evacuation of the injured, and training of medical personnel. As you see, we'll get into some of the things that he helped do with the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so just he organized systems that even today we still use, and so we'll get into some of that in just a second as well. So one of the first things we want to talk about as you can see up here is kind of the, the flying ambulance, as they called it. It's really more of a field ambulance. Uh, but one, in the Napoleonic era, your field hospital was roughly three miles behind enemy lines. And soldiers, to get them from the front lines back there, sometimes could take up to three days. So a lot of the soldiers were succumbing to their wounds uh, on that process of getting back. And so uh, Baron Leray, uh, what he really decided to do is we got to intervene much earlier in the system. And he saw that horse-drawn carriages were bringing cannons up to the front line and moving them back and forth all around the front line in a matter of minutes. And he says, well, why can't we do that with humans? And so he converted those into a carriage, and he could kind of sweep around the battlefield and pick up patients within 15 minutes and get these guys back to a hospital much sooner. And then he started to realize, well, why don't I bring my surgeons forward and have them start doing care much earlier in the game? And so he would get surgeons in the back of these carriages, bring them to the front line. They'd run around, gather people, and get them to a safe spot to kind of work on things. And that was really kind of this idea that we even use today in Afghanistan when I was out there. We had our forward operating bases with surgical teams out in these little areas to get to those wounds as quick as we could. And so he was really innovative with these you know, ideas of the flying ambulance is what he called it. And I also flew on helicopters in Afghanistan, and so I can say that we brought his idea to fruition and that I was actually a flying ambulance. I was running out there picking up patients and bringing them back. So I think he would be proud of us today that we took his conception and we brought it to real life much later on. In addition to the field ambulance, he also was involved with triage, as we all know it today. So back in the day in the Napoleonic Wars, you were basically treated by your class. So Colonel Swingle and I would, even if I had just a scratch on my finger, we would be the first ones to get our first aid. And we could have a young airman over here with a cannonball to the leg and partly amputated, and he'd just have to wait until we got our little finger taken care of. So Baron Leray said, this doesn't seem right. Let's try to change this up. And so he started working on it on the severity of injury. And he kind of classified it into three regions, severe, mild in a sense, or something that could wait. And then those were that we kind of call today the expectant category. Um, and so that really started to save lives, and he really was able to intervene much earlier and bring troops back to the field, which obviously helped the Napoleon Wars. Um, and in the inspectant category, you know, it was funny because when they would kind of deem that you weren't maybe going to make it, they would just give you some wine and let you kind of die away in comfort. And that was kind of the French approach at the time. So, but we still use those same categories today. Uh, when we do our mass casualty exercises, we kind of have our immediate category, our delayed, minimals, and then the expectant. So we only have, we have an extra one in there today. But his concept has helped us through the Civil War, Iraq, Afghanistan. We still use this triage system today. And so another great innovation. Um, in addition to that, he kind of 
improved and uh, really developed amputation, if you will. At the time, what they would kind of do if someone got their leg shot off or whatever, they would just circumferentially cut everything, kind of pull the skin as hard as they could around, tidy it up. And to do that, they would actually wait sometimes 20 to 40 days to allow that wound to kind of heal down, but also to allow the human to accept the fact and the shock of what just happened to them and accept that they may not have a limb. And again, he was like, well, we can't wait this long. This is causing way too much gangrene, infection, and wound dehiscence because it was stretching those skin so hard that he developed a new technique where you would kind of go in, take the muscle and bone out much further. He would do it much sooner, um, within days of the injury if he could, and he would wrap that skin around and, and tighten it up. And that's kind of the same process as we use today with amputation. So an incredibly innovative individual, and he really kind of started the idea of what can doctors bring to the, the, the commander of an army? And um, some other things that he kind of hit on real quick is pericardiocentesis. He figured out how to do ligation of the femoral artery above the, or below the pupils line. Um, he worked with positive pressure breathing to treat chest wound injuries uh, and was using snow and ice to anesthetize the limb before he would amputate. So the precursors to anesthesia and all these other things that we do today, uh, he really was innovative. Um, and was also known as a huge humanitarian. Out on the field, he would treat his enemy comrades just as much as he would treat his own. And he would take care of both sides of the field. He would go around and collect up the dead after the uh, battles too and try to bring them over and try to uh, respectfully you know, take care of that situation as well. So just all around, a, a great four leader to what we want to call as operational medicine. So kind of jumping ahead from his time frame, uh, go back and we're gonna jump ahead to World War I basically. And during World War I, we spent a lot of time and effort on the machines that we were kind of building and sending out and not so much on the human machine. And it was during this time that we realized we actually probably need to optimize the human to perform better. And so again, the medicine team started engaging with those commanders saying we can make your people better in a sense to get out there and fight the wars. And so we started off uh, with Air Force was actually an army product initially, so the Army Air Aviation Units. And within that area, we started a school uh, to try to help create flight surgeons and people who can help with those aviators as our first arena to kind of help the machine. Because again, as long as the human's okay, then we're probably good, right? If we get into a plane, and the plane malfunctions, but the human's doing okay, sometimes they can still land that plane. But in the event of a, a human who goes south, well, there's probably no hope and you're gonna end up in the wires like this guy did, all right? And so we really started to realize that it's the human that we need to work on and not so much the planes and the machines that are out there. So with that in mind, after World War I came Dr. Bauer. Um, and again, this was another individual who has a long list of achievements and we'll kind of get into some of those. He graduated from Harvard, both from college and in medical school, and then went into the Army. He became a director of medical research after World War I, and he helped establish the Army School of Aviation Medicine. Uh, and that, he was a commandant for that for six years. And while he was there, he wrote a book called The Aviation Medicine, and that is still kind of a book. It's been through many iterations and renditions, but it's the book that I used to pass my boards for aerospace medicine, in a sense. And that Army School of Aviation Medicine later became the different flight surgeon schools for the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Um, and so I graduated from the United States Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine in 2019 with my residency. And he is basically, I can go back and thank Dr. Bauer for my career at this point in time. And as you see in the civilian world, he also played a big part in my life as well um, from that avenue. So he got released early from the Army because he was so good at what he did. And in 1926, when they created the Air Commerce Act, they wanted to create a, a Bureau of Air Commerce. And so he led that, and that eventually became the FAA as we know it today. Then in 1966, it became the Federal Aviation Administration. So he was instrumental in starting that. He also created the standards for that, and then went into helping devise like three classes of pilots. It's your airline pilots for Delta, American Airlines, your more of your cargo ones for UPS, FedEx, and then your private pilot's license. And those are the same three categories we have today. In addition to that, he kind of, uh, recruited doctors to help uh, assess these pilots, and those are called aeromedical examiners, AMEs. It's the same name we use today in the FAA world. And in fact, I was an AME for a little while uh, in my career on and off, and I've, uh, I've been down to the FAA to see what they do and a bunch of things there. So his whole system in the FAA, he created, and it's still existing today and doing very well. When you also talk about some of the achievements uh, he did, so. Once he got those AMEs going, he gathered about 30 of them together after a couple of years and they created a, a foundation or the Aeromedical Association. And uh, 
This has gone through a few name changes as well, but today it's known as the Aerospace Medical Association, or ASMA. And in fact, uh, I'm leaving tomorrow to drive down to Reno to go attend that conference starting on Sunday. And so again, this is still existing. And the journal that's associated with that association, the Journal of, Human, of Aerospace Medicine and Human Performance, it's their leading journal. Um, we as RAM graduates had to write articles for that journal and it still exists and we're still using it today. Um, so it's just incredible uh, the amount of Midas touch that he had with anything in aerospace medicine. He also helped create the aerospace medicine as a board certification. And so with this background and leading up from the 1920s until we are today, flight medicine has really been the cusp of operational medicine. And we started with the aviators, but as we move along, we started to see that, hey, there may be other things we can do, not just with the flying community. Um, now, what is a flight surgeon today? You know, I wear this outfit and I wear the flight suit, and why do I wear the flight suit? It's partly to become a brotherhood with the pilots. They're not going to trust me unless I kind of earn their trust, and that's hanging out with them, solving problems for them. Oftentimes, if you help their family, that's going to earn more trust than if you help them. And so it's just constantly being there. You guys can relate very well if you're a sports medicine physician. It's like being part of a team. You got to know that sport. You got to kind of be out there with them. You got to help them and their families and do what you can with them. As it kind of says up here, you end up being a doctor, a priest, and a lawyer, and that's true. I've had more conversations at the bar drinking a beer with them or doing something else to carry on and, and solve their problems than I have, uh, you know, doing actual medicine. And, the, and it just it goes a long way with that unit just to be part of what they're doing so you understand their stresses. Uh, we as flight surgeons tend to fly in the planes with them. I don't necessarily always get to fly it per se, but I'm in the back riding a lot of times. But it's in part to see what stresses they have in the air and what we can do. So when you come in with your stub toe, I can recognize, hey, that actually might not be good to fly with. Or no, yep, in your airframe, it's okay to do that. And so I need to understand those stressors that they're in, much like a team physician would have to really understand those different positions of what you can do. And so this is kind of where we really have developed a, a, a good core, good cadre of flight surgeons and how they're helping their units. And we realized this is a great model. If we can get this out to other arenas, we can do some things. So again, if we go back to the idea that Baron LeRae wanted to bring surgeons to the front of the field, well, her special operations team has, uh, as you can see, a trauma surgeon, emergency physician, a nurse anesthetist. These are folks that are trying to get out to the front line to provide that care. But we also realize the human being is not just about physical medicine. A lot of it's about mental well-being and what you can do with that. And so we're developing teams now called operational support teams that are going to embed in our different units to help provide mental health capabilities, prevention techniques, whether it be athletic trainers, strength coaches, physical therapists, things to kind of be on that leading edge so that we kind of prevent you from getting to something that you need to go see a doctor for. And so these are some of the developments of the teams that we're seeing today. So kind of a quick history of where we were. Again, back in the days of the Napoleonic War, we really focused on the soldiers and just trying to treat those injuries and trying to do a better job with that. Then we kind of took that to the aviation world and we started to say, hey, if we can get our pilots doing well, then they won't crash as many planes. And we really focused on that arena. But we started to realize our intel troops, our pararescue troops, these are the folks that go out and do some uh, almost elite athlete level you know, training and stuff. With our intel folks, the big thing there was literally they would be watching videos um, of a family over in Afghanistan or somewhere, and they'd watch them for weeks and weeks and weeks, almost get to know that family. And then they might watch a missile come in and blow that family up. They would see that on screen, and then they'd have to go home 30 minutes later and go celebrate their kid's birthday. And that was just a lot of hard mental processing to do. And so we realized that we needed to kind of embed some mental health providers within those units and help them talk through things even before they left the building. Talk through stuff if you've been there for a few weeks seeing this kind of stuff. And so uh, with our remotely piloted air airframes, RPAs, and our intel troops, this has really been a beneficial step in their direction to help them out and, and help uh, process the things that they see. Now we're starting to expand this even further. We're looking at our maintenance squadrons, our cybersecurity squadrons, our logistics squadrons. What can we do to help these guys prevent injury and help with their mental health issues too that we can solve ahead of time? And so that's, I think, where we're gonna see the future of operational medicine go. Um, and so we are kind of the jack of all trades you know, area. So um, as you can see, the largest utility knife ever, right, uh, in that regards. And so you can be any flavor of medicine, if you will, uh, physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, medical technician, and you can be part of a variety of teams. Some are embedded in intel units, some are embedded with flyers, some are embedded with special operations types. And then you're also gonna be called on to do 
kind of full scope care. Uh, when I was in Kandahar, we had CT machines, we had a, a practical little ICU, we had surgical suites that they were just doing incredible surgeries on. Um, you know, 64 pints of blood just to save a person's life to get them through that surgery and get them on. And it was just, a, it was an amazing thing. But you might also be at a very um, uh, limited scope facility in the sense that I've also been the sole doc taking care of about 100 people on one little area. And you're kind of it. So I've become medical logistics. I've become air medical transportation. I'm my own nurse. And you just, it, it, it really is varied as to what you may end up doing. And then there's even the situation where we talk about air medical evacuation, you can be doing these kind of critical care skills on the back of an airplane. And that may not seem like much until you start thinking about flying like from Japan to Hawaii and you're over the Pacific Ocean with really nowhere to land. And if someone starts having a severe heart attack on that plane or the, the critical care patient you have is starting to not do well, that's it, you're it. You have nothing but yourself to try to make that happen. And so we do put our physicians and nurses into some pretty tricky situations, and yet they have been phenomenally, uh, they've just done really phenomenally well with managing those kind of critical patients and, and getting air medical evacuation taken care of around the world. So, and then you also get some of the weird things like public health, bioengineering. Um, I get called on to inspect our defects when I'm out deployed. I get called on to inspect Burger King on base to make sure that they're not doing improper food handling or doing something that would poison our troops and things like that. So you get pulled in a lot of different directions. Nobody in medical school taught me how to inspect Burger Kings, but here I go and I do that. So operational medicine is really kind of unique and you find yourself doing some things that you never thought you'd be doing. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move on to military medical standards. And why is this important? So in the Air Force, we have a session standards. It takes a certain amount of things that you need to have to get into the Air Force. Once we get you in, then we talk about retention standards and kind of specialty standards. The retention standards are a little less strict. So once we get you in, we're willing to work with you a little bit on the medical conditions that you might develop while you're in the military. And then we have some specialty ones where you talk about your pilots, maybe security forces, different areas. They're gonna have a few more standards to live up to than what your, maybe your finance troop or someone else may have in the military. And these are important because this really kind of helps us determine who should be in the Air Force. We don't want to send someone down range that is gonna end up hurting that team or more importantly, hurting themselves. And so we really gotta make sure that they are fit for the Air Force. And so how do we do that? Well, here's kind of an example of one of our medical standards. So as you can kind of see here, this one's touching on migraines. And you can see in the red, it talks about migraine. And so the yellow column is where we talk about retentions or the DW, which is deployable with limitations. And then the rest of those categories are all related to flying or special operational duties. There's an X in that box, it means you're disqualified because of this diagnosis. So if you had a single migraine, or other headache disorders for that matter, and then it met these three qualifiers, if it took you away from work for a certain amount of time, required multiple specialty follow-ups, or, or took you away from your duty, then that would potentially make you disqualified from the Air Force and we might medically board you out. There's a process, and not everybody who has one migraine or life gets out of the Air Force. We can keep several of these in because they don't need regular follow-up. The medicines work well for them, and they can stay in. And as you can see, even in the column below, where you have a history of one of those headaches, that would still allow you to be in. So when it comes to documentation from you guys in the outside community, if you're saying history of headaches, that really means something to us versus active migraine headaches. And so that documentation is really critical as to how you guys are kind of looking at the scenario, what you're saying on your notes, because we're gonna rely on you, the neurology specialist, to help me, the generalist, kind of understand what's going on with these patients. And so you can kind of see where we kind of get into, one diagnosis can have two different flavors to the military and how we keep people in or out. Another example would be a spontaneous pneumothorax. So you can have one spontaneous pneumothorax and we're fine, we'll let you stay in. May not let you fly, uh, but we'll still let you stay in, right? Now, if you have repetitive uh, spontaneous pneumothoraxes and they're not amenable to a surgical fix, then you might be out of the Air Force. Um, and so again, documenting well, letting us know that, hey, even though this person had a second pneumothorax, but we feel he's amenable to surgical correction, can we get him down that road? Then this might be someone we try to say, let's keep him in, let's get him that surgery, let's see if we can't keep him in as a soldier versus sending him out. So these are important things, and again, you can see asthma up there as well. A lot of times our troops will kind of come out and they'll try to talk to you guys, our community partners, and say, hey, I can't have asthma, that'll get me out of the Air Force, which is not true, we have people in the Air Force who have asthma, but they'll want you to kind of downgrade that diagnosis, right? They'll try to wheel and deal with you a little bit and say, I think I just have exercise-induced bronchospasm, right? It's only when I exercise. So 
we in the military, we kind of, it, it's, it's the pig, right? So I don't care what color lipstick you put on there. We know it's a version of asthma and we will look at that situation. So, um, you know, just diagnose what you think is the appropriate diagnosis and then we will work it from there inside. But, you know, don't try to have them weasley into a diagnosis that you think may or may not get them in or out of the Air Force, all right? Because we can work with a lot of these diagnoses and keep people in. And so that's a big piece of what we need to look at as well. We have some other programs, not just flyers and stuff, who are special, if you will. And so we have our personnel reliability program and then our arming use of force. And both of these are reliability programs. In other words, we want to ensure the people that are working around critical weapon systems or carrying handguns on base, that they are reliable people, that we can trust that they're not gonna misuse these access to weapons or the weapon themselves. And so again, these guys kind of have another layer of standards that we will apply. And again, we, ask, uh, we often ask, to, hey, can we get that note from you? Because I, as a, what we call certified medical or a competent medical authority, have to review all of these notes and make sure that they can go back and still carry that gun the next day. So sometimes you'll get a little pressure from us to say, hey, can I get that note? Can I get that note? I just need to know if I can get this troop back to action. And please don't take offense to that. It's just us trying to figure out what we can do to help our team over there. And that's kind of my big take home point with all of this. You sometimes will get requests. Sometimes we send paperwork out to you guys, our community partners, to say, hey, if you can just kind of give me a diagnosis, some medications, and a quick blurb on what happened at this appointment, then we can take that and we can kind of decide right away if this person's gonna be good or bad. Because um, sometimes it has taken us a month or two to get notes from different hospital systems. And that two month wait, we might wanna deploy someone in one week. We might wanna deploy them in one month. And trying to get that note is really kind of burdensome to us at times. And so just getting a quick take from you guys really helps us decide can this person go and support the team or not support the team? And so from us at Hill Air Force Base, um, you know, we greatly do thank all the specialties and the care that we get around here. It's been phenomenal, uh, but we just also don't want to offend you guys by saying, hey, sometimes we need to rush, rush this, and can you please get us some information? And so please don't be offended if a piece of paper shows up in your office and it's just asking us to give a quick summary of what's going on, all right? Um, and with that, uh, again, just a quick review. We talked about our transition to DHA, how it's a huge transition. All three services are working together to get through this. We touched on Hill Air Force Base's mission. It's not just the loud jets you hear, but there's a lot of stuff going on in there, and especially a large industrial complex. Uh, we talked about operational medicine and how we've gone from kind of battlefield to more of a preventive approach and trying to be mindfulness with all the things that are going on. And then finally, kind of, hey, we might ask you some favors from our team, but it's only to help us help our troops and keep them fighting and doing what they need to do. So with that, I will stand by for any questions. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Nobody else has a question, I have one. So um, I'm actually very conversant with uh, military medical evacuation because I saw MASH a number of years ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so how does it compare if you really have to do an evacuation to that show nowadays? Yeah, so I've, I've been on kind of two different ends of that, if you will. So when I was in Afghanistan trying to coordinate the outgoing evacuation, if you will, and then I've also spent time at Launchstuhl in uh, Ramstein, Germany on the receiving end and then transferring them even from there back home. And so um, it is somewhat like the MASH world. Uh, when I was flying on the dust-off mission, which is the helicopter mission in Afghanistan supporting the Army, we would literally go out and pick people up in the helicopters, bring them back to our Kandahar base, and then from there we would get them on larger planes that would get them up to Launchstuhl. What we call this is a roll system. So your roll zero is the troop out there in their Humvee and they just got blown up and they're providing care to their buddy. That's kind of roll zero, roll one. Roll two is that little forward operating base where we might have one surgeon and a nurse and they can do some preliminary, let's stop the bleeding kind of game. Then we get them to the roll three, which is, was like Kandahar, and we had CTs, ICUs, large surgical suites, things that we could do. And then a roll four is back to like a large hospital system, has all the specialties, surgical suites, and that's like in launch tool. A roll five is just anything in the US, basically. And so we would work our way through those roll systems. And so MASH is kind of your roll three, if you will. Um, that's where they had some of the surgical abilities, they had some things there, but they weren't just a single doctor and a nurse out at some little tiny location. But our ability to do what you saw in MASH has just exponentially grown. We, we can transport a patient who got injured um, in a Humvee or you know an explosion 
uh, within a day, if we got them to back to the base, got them stabilized, got them on a plane, and we could get them to launch to or US within 24 hours. And so it really is somewhat like what you saw on MASH, but we are capable of doing that, and we had some of our lowest death rates ever in a, in a, in a battle because of our ability to air evac people out of the theater. Does that help kind of explain that? Yeah, um, thank you. If, if you're able, can you tell us a little bit about the, the types of physicians and, and team you have up at, at uh, Hill? So the, the makeup of the yeah yeah just kind of whips kind of specialties and how what kind of physicians you have uh, working up yep no absolutely um, so we're an outpatient clinic uh, so we kind of have our uh, primary care level uh, specialties so family practice there's some pediatrics and then are kind of uh, operational medicine is what we kind of call it and that's going to help with all of our active duty types um, and then we also have a women's health clinic we have mental health. And then we have, because we have such a large industrial base on this particular base, we actually have a whole OCMED team there as well that kind of handle all the occupational medicine issues that pop up throughout the, that workforce. So uh, we also have physical therapy and dental. Yes, thank you. And dental is another one of our specialties that we kind of have there. We have x-ray capabilities, and that's it. We don't really have MRIs or CT. We have lab that they can get a lot of our labs drawn. We have immunization clinics. Uh, and a pharmacy um, is another one of our big play. In fact, pharmacy is our busiest thing in the hospital. They service like, it's like, yeah, it's the busiest pharmacy in the state of Utah. You know, 58,000, you know, it's just huge. They are constantly, constantly, uh, you know, working with people out, out in the, our lobby. So, so that's kind of our uh, class. Then we have medical technicians, we have nurses, we have case managers, disease managers, um, all the things that you'd kind of see in a hospital system like that. Uh, and that's kind of makes up our, our clientele, um, and we're about, the med group is about 500 strong uh, individuals, mix of active duty, civilian, DOD employees, and contractors, um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a busy place every day, always something going on. Yeah, just, just quickly, um, so it sounds like you interact with the patients in a, you know, like a bar or a place like that, and I was just wondering, it may be easier because you're in the military, but if there are any sort of medical legal concerns or yeah. maybe l rules you have or protocols you follow? Yeah, you know, the, the, the curbside console, right? I'm just walking through the squadron to check on something over there, and they're like, hey, doc, you know, I got this friend who has this problem. Really, tell me more about that, you know? And so you just pull them into a room, and you get into the privacy areas and stuff like that. At the bars, we're usually not talking about uh, medical stuff. We're just, I'm just laughing at all their jokes because that makes them feel really cool, right? And so it's just really being there to support whatever event is going on. If they're having a barbecue at the docks, usually the guy flipping the burgers over there, right? If they're having an event in some capacity, you're the one kind of there. And really, as your role as a flight surgeon or an embedded doc, you're, you belong to the commander. Um, so you're, you're really an extension of that commander. And it's your job to kind of let the commander know, like, hey, I'm concerned about this individual. He probably shouldn't be flying right now. Um, he's going through a divorce, or his mother just died, and, and mentally maybe he's just not there. Can we take him off the flying list? And a pilot would much rather have you, the doctor, take him off of flying versus him having to come in and say, hey, I'm, I'm kind of weak right now. I don't know that I should fly. You know, They don't like to admit to that. It's their mentality that they can beat anything and do anything. And so they don't want to admit that they can't do something. They'd rather have someone else say, it's the doc telling me I can't do this. And so a lot of that camaraderie is just more, you're just there to kind of entertain and enjoy and have fun with them. Um, I mean, I have several friends who don't drink and they're out there drinking their spritzes with them and their iced teas and everything else. But it's just the fact that you're there and, and being part of that event, that's what builds that trust with them. Um, so if that helps explain. Yep. So for, for most of us, what Sometimes it feels like what we can and can't do is dictated a lot by insurance coverage. I would yeah. imagine for you it's more about government funding. So question is, how much is the, is the military health service uh, in flux depending on what the funding is from year to year or every four years or whatever? That must be your lane a little bit, but uh, yeah, so funding does drive some of the stuff that we deal with. Um, TRICARE is our insurance plan. And it too has kind of the same gatekeepers that you guys deal with as well. I might want to refer someone out to get a procedure done and TRICARE might say, no, we're not going to approve this just yet because you haven't done certain conservative therapies first or whatever. Uh, or they will kind of question that MRI that you're ordering for the mild back pain that the person has. And so we deal a little bit with that insurance piece, but yeah, funding definitely plays into our ability to hire certain contractors or purchase certain pieces of equipment that we feel would be really important. And I think we're 
Uh, at times we feel that squeeze, even at uh, a smaller outpatient clinic like this versus a larger one. Um, I don't know if there's a better way to, yeah. Can I ask you two questions also? Or you want, you're still answering, go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah, she's gonna help answer that one. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, so we are uh, physically constrained. That is, definitely, that is definitely true. I think that that is one of the reasons why Congress said military medicine um, you will merge, and you're, we're going to do this better. Um, our bills are pretty expensive. Uh, I will tell you, though, that as an MTF commander, I am responsible to stay within the means of my funding. So Congress, you know, pushes down what they're going to give DOD military medicine, and it's dispersed through the services. And it's my responsibility to stay within those means. Um, we utilize, a, we try to get our third-party collections so we try to see what other insurance out there that our patients and our beneficiaries have. Unfortunately, we have a really good military medical system and a lot of our beneficiaries, that's the only, that's the only insurance they have. So it's a constant, how are we gonna try to save money? And I think that we will do better um, in time as we standardize and because we have bigger purchasing power. And the, the intent is when we go buy our medical equipment, that we do it in bulk uh, to hopefully save money to go back into the to the facilities, um, but I think you will see military medicine changing in our footprint too in the future. Um, all the bases that you saw that are on there, they will probably reduce down uh, because we have wonderful civilian networks um, that can hopefully take care of our beneficiaries. So under DHA, it is all about the healthcare delivery. The first and foremost is the warfighter. And then after that, whatever else we have left, that's when we can take care of our dependents. And sometimes it's cheaper to pay for it on the outside than to have it into the military system. So I think in, over the next 10 to 12 years, you're gonna see bases reduced down. Um, I think you will see bases that don't even see the dependents anymore, that we let the community take care of them and we just see our active duty members. Um, so yes, we are definitely, there's physical constraints when, when it comes to you know, we're, we're not there to make money, we don't bring in a lot of money, very little money, and we just, we work off what Congress has given us to deliver the benefit. Does that make sense? Question, within medicine, obviously, you have Marines follow under the umbrella of the Navy in medical care. Will aerospace medicine fall under the umbrella of the Air Force in medical care at the current time? That's question, question one. Second question, I have to resume with the merged medical care you're giving, I presume you will stay as three different uniformed services, however. Uh, so for the first question with the aerospace medicine, no, um, it, Navy and Army both have aerospace medicine schools as well, and they can graduate residents in those realms. Um, and so those haven't combined into one yet as far as the DHA collection process. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's gonna come down the road, but right now they have stayed separate. And then real quick with your second question, can you say that again for me? The, the second question, I, I presume that you will stay as three uniform services, basically Army, Navy, Air Force, as far as what uniform you're wearing in your care. Yes, yes, right, yep, we will kind of still say uh, Air Force blue, Navy blue, and Army green, I guess. Uh, we're not gonna transition to a purple uniform uh, or a pink uniform by any means anytime soon. Uh, so we will, we will kind of continue those divisions, but, um, the way Navy does public health and the way the Air Force does public health right now, we're kind of duplicating efforts and they're a little bit different. And what we're trying to do is say, well, how is public health for a Navy man any really different than us, barring some ship type stuff? Um, but really we're trying to say we could all kind of do the same thing. And that's what we're really trying to standardize across the three forces. But we will stay out there. And now of course you can add in the Space Force as well, right? So uh, that's another uh, uniform that people will be wearing. Um, but yeah, we will stay separate. Any other questions? Thank you both. That was very enlightening. There is one more question that was asked for you, and that is, are you addressed as colonel or as doctor? Yeah, so uh, it probably depends on the setting. So I, I wear multiple hats at my job. Um, when I'm down in the clinic, then it's Dr. Nussbaum. Um, when I'm out doing more of the leadership role or other things, then it's a Colonel Nussbaum. Uh, really, it, so in the military, you're an officer uh, and then a doctor or a nurse. So 
you have to kind of take on that officer role first and, and really own up to that. And so I'm a colonel in most places, but when I'm in with my patients and doing that, it's Dr. Newsbaum. So out here, you guys, Lance, works fine. <laughs> All right. So do you have time for one more? Yes, yes, go ahead. So I work for these two colonels here. I'm in the occupational medicine side. The thing that's unique about Hill is that there's a huge civilian workforce, bigger than almost every other organization in the Air Force. And we do things that are just amazing compared to others. And so I think it's, it's, it behooves us to, to know that uh, their uh, workers' compensation system that uh, pays the bills for those people that get hurt on the job is uh, vastly different. You guys have had experience with it and it drives you crazy like it does us, but we have to go by this and we appreciate your patience when it comes to this sort of thing because we have to get those people cared for so they can get the job done that the government's paying them for. And we appreciate that. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you very much. Excellent.